Ladies and gentlemen, my name is Bruce Jones. I'm the Vice President for Foreign Policy here at Brookings. Thank you for joining us on a rainy morning. It's my very distinct pleasure and honor to welcome Todd Stern back to Brookings. Uh, Todd started his career on the domestic side of politics, worked as a senior counselor to Senator Patrick Leahy in the Senate Judiciary Committee before playing a, a pretty key role in the Clinton uh, White House on domestic and economic policy. Uh, he told me once it was a, sort of an accident that he was assigned this, at then time, rather obscure portfolio called the Kyoto Negotiations, but rather faithfully so. Uh, Todd continued then to play a key role on climate issues in the White House and at Treasury, and then in the all-important think tank sector at the Center for American Progress and GMF and elsewhere. Uh, before returning to government service in 2008 as part of the Clinton transition team, before being appointed by President Obama in 2009 as his special envoy for climate change. Todd was with Obama for the ill-starred Copenhagen negotiations, and then I think took a, a different and extremely consequential path. Namely, he began to exert real leadership in crafting a series of very consequential bilateral climate uh, agreements, the most consequential of which I would argue was the U.S.-China agreement on short-lived climate pollutants, which really transformed the diplomatic landscape by showing that the two largest economies and the two largest emitters in the world were committed to the urgency of climate change and to uh, crafting a pathway forward. And in recognition of it, Foreign Policy magazine listed Todd and his Chinese counterpart as among the top 100 uh, thinkers and foreign policy leaders in the world. And I, I recommend to you, it's not usually the case that I would recommend to people to read the language of a diplomatic agreement, but if you want to understand uh, the urgency and the consequence of the issue we're grappling with, go back and read the 2014 U.S.-China climate agreement. Uh, that transformed the global landscape. Uh, a series of other bilateral deals followed, uh, agreements in the major emitters forum, major economies forum, I guess as it's now called, uh, and took us to where we are today namely just having come back from Paris with a, a breakthrough global agreement on climate. So before I uh, welcome Todd to the stage, let me ask you to join me in thanking Todd and through him, uh, Secretary Kerry and President Obama, for returning us to a position of American leadership on global climate and for the really historic work that you did to get us where we are today. So, Todd, thank you very much. start by asking you this. Did you get any sleep in Paris? Uh, yeah, I, I got uh, about the uh, – first of all, thank you, everybody, for coming, and thank you for the nice round of applause. Very much appreciated. Um, yeah, you know, the, the, the routine of these things is that you're usually kind of hovering around four or five hours, and then, you know, you get, get deeply into it, and you get the nights where you get home at five or six in the morning, and uh, – but – uh, but it, it was not worse than <laughs> not worse than others in that respect. Uh, despite that, I am not only reliably informed. I have photographic evidence of a rather late night uh, celebration after the effect. It must have it, felt pretty good. It, too. It's true. Um, I, so the the the, the backstory there is that uh, we were <coughs> back in the Marriott, um, Charles de Gaulle Marriott, which is the uh, the, the luxurious um, <laughs> accommodations that we had during this conference and. Uh, and the you know our team having bar food at 12:30 or so, and at about 1:30, I thought I said to my guys, most of whom are a little younger than I am, um, <laughs> that uh, you know I was I was ready to go up, and they said we can't go up because there's a party in Paris tonight. I said party in Paris tonight, which is half an <laughs> hour away, and it's 1:30, and and I said yeah, you guys go, you know I'm going upstairs, and Paul Bodner, who's on the White House now but used to be on my team, said. Uh, 
Okay, that that's good. You just you know you'll go the next time we do the biggest climate change. Ever. <laughs> <laughs> so I said, okay, I'll meet you in ten minutes, and uh, <laughs> off we went to Paris. And I called my kids, um, not to brag about the climate change agreements, but to brag about the fact that their daddy was going out for a party at one forty-five nice. in the morning, <laughs> and uh, and got home sometime after five. So yes, that was. But that was my own doing. So. <laughs> uh, let me just ask you then to start by in your own. Terms. What did we accomplish in Paris? What were the key breakthroughs? So uh, we accomplished a great deal, and indeed, um, you know, more honestly, more than we had even expected. Although very much along the lines of what we were trying to do. So, uh, for starters, it's the first universal, uh, lasting climate regime that that is really applicable to all parties. I mean, there have been others that that in some sense cover everybody, but not in the sense that everybody is actually taking action. So that's first. Second of all, um, really important with respect to, uh, to ambition. We, we start, started off with the completely extraordinary fact that there were 186 countries that had put forward their targets, their so-called IMDCs in the lingo, uh, during the course of, uh, of uh, 2015. Um, and then there was an architecture built around that in the agreement of uh, five-year cycles to ratchet those up. Uh, and uh, countries either put in new targets or if they're in the middle of a longer target period, they have to either revise it upward or, or reconfirm it in, in you know, every five years. Uh, and, that, and the five-year cycle follows a, a, a global stock take um, to, sh to see where we are in the aggregate vis-a-vis -vis our, you know, our long-term goals, vis-a-vis -vis what science is telling us. So, you, so you've got an every five-year stock take, and then about a year after the every five-year stock take, countries have to either reconfirm and say, yes, I'm, I'm going to hold where I am, or I'm going to increase where I am, or if they're in, that in, in the period of time where they have to put in target anyway, they, obviously they do. So that was really important. We have very strong global goals, uh, both uh, we, you know, we already had a below two degree to go goal. We still have that, although even that's kind of ratcheted up to a well below two degrees and an effort to pursue even further to go to 1.5. And, uh, and a further goal of what is essentially uh, emissions neutrality, um, uh, no net emissions uh, by the, uh, during the course of this century. Uh, so, you know, as, as much absorbed as you admit. So that's, you know, we're, we're far away from that, but that's a very strong goal. And so you have universal apply to everybody, really strong ambition, and then kind of the, 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 the uh, counterpart to uh, or necessary feature of ambition is a strong, and in this case, legally binding uh, transparency and accountability system. So. Uh, countries have to uh, keep uh, do inventories according to international standards. They've got to report on those inventories and report on the progress they're making toward achieving their target. Uh, and all of that gets reviewed by expert review teams and also discussed in a kind of peer uh, peer uh, review session that will take place during uh, during the you know end of year meetings. Uh, so you have that. That's number three, I guess. Uh, the fourth thing is that uh, the, the architecture of the agreement with respect to the age-old problem that has bedeviled these negotiations, which is the, the division, but sort of the firewall between developed and developing countries, as set in 1992, the two categories were, were devised in the 19, original 1992 kind of granddaddy treaty. And, the, and the, the, the problem has been that nobody is willing to move, to move out of their category, and nobody has been willing to kind of evolve the nature of, uh, of what that means. So the, the classic agreement that, that embodied that old division was Kyoto, which was all obligations were for developed countries, developing countries not asked to do anything. And although we had moved, we had moved gradually uh, a little bit away from that. Still, not enough. So there was a there was this very significant move embodied in this agreement away from that. And a perfect example of, of what of, of the kind of differentiation that we mean. And you know, we're totally supportive of the idea of differentiation because you can't expect all countries, different development stages, and so forth, to do the same thing. But the kind of differentiation 
that works is what is embodied in the notion of nationally determined commitments or nationally determined in the lingo, nationally determined contributions for mitigation. So every country puts forward its own plan. That's the 186 targets I'm talking about. Everybody puts forward their own plan. They're, they're urged, encouraged, sort of gently pressured to do the best that they can, and we actually had a particular procedural um, device that we, that we proposed and that worked very, very well uh, to make sure that, that, that those targets would be as strong as possible. But that's a, that's a differentiation across the spectrum of countries, not into uh, kind of uh, starkly different categories that don't make any sense as, as we go forward, to think that China and Korea and, 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 and countries that are developing rapidly should be treated the same way as least developing countries obviously makes no sense. Developing countries right now are 65% of global emissions and rising, so you, you can't deal with the problem that way. Um, strong focus, stronger than ever, on, on the issue of adaptation, which is you know, what countries have to do to deal with the impacts of climate change that are already upon us and that you can't avoid. Uh, and then I think uh, good, balanced, um, you know, continued strong provisions for financial and technology support. So that's kind of the package. And, uh, and it was, um, as they say, remarkably robust. You know, and there, there really was a kind of a coterie of countries that were aiming at a much more middle, minimalist uh, agreement. And uh, to their credit, the French always... The French kind of had a true north, I think, um, uh, in, in this negotiation, which was to produce a high ambition agreement. And, of course, that's where we were and that's where many others were. But it actually happened. It struck me at the time of the – I remember that um, uh, the French president, Don Obama, drafted – I'm sure you wrote a joint op-ed uh, looking towards the summit – that the stars have not been this well aligned in terms of a president that's committed to the issue – uh, and the chairmanship of the process by a close U.S. ally with serious diplomatic capability. I mean, that must have made a big difference to have yeah. that configuration in the, in the structure of the negotiations. I think it made a huge difference, actually. Uh, and, um, uh, you know, again, the, <coughs> I mean, this is, it's an enormously complex undertaking what the French have to do, and it's an odd, <coughs> it's an odd way climate negotiations work, that there is a new, <coughs> a new president of the negotiations every year. So the French have the had presidency this year, but it, it's really hard to do it. It's not at all self-evident how you pull this whole kind of ungainly body together. And you kind of start to figure it out, and then it's somebody else's turn. Okay. So, uh, so there's, there's not a lot of uh, historical um, learning that you're able to – but the French – um, they, they, did, they did a very good job, and, as they, and you know, to, to your point, they were really committed to a, you know, a vision of a strong agreement and uh, that would have high ambition and you know and, um, and a number of other things and that I think that made a really big difference. Um, the central criticism of the deal is going to be, look, <coughs> uh, it's good in terms of getting to an outcome in Paris that you had this bottom-up approach of nationally determined contributions, but even the nationally determined contributions that we've already seen don't get us to right. under 2%. Right. And, and even then, um, you know, if you look at the Indian contribution, even in the American contribution, et cetera, you can pose genuine questions about the, the assumptions that are behind them. Do we have to have you know, really heroic assumptions about what's going to happen in technology to right. see even those, uh, even those outcomes? So how do you respond to that? Well, I, look, I think that nobody, nobody doing this deal uh, looked at this, and nobody, nobody doing this negotiation looked and thought, Paris is the time where we're going to like lick the problem. It, it, we're we're going we're to do a Paris Agreement, and we're going to be you know, we're going to be coasting after that. That was just completely not not in the cards. What what we saw, though, I think, is a very powerful step forward uh, in the course of, of the last year. Um, let me just make a slight detour. So we had these this INDC intended nationally determined. Well, actually, we had the, this, the idea of nationally determined contributions in the first instance. We then proposed, uh, and it was very much um, with a view toward, toward trying to, to come up with a procedural device that would encourage countries to do the, the most that they could. And, uh, and it was, there, was, there was just you know, one sort of further uh, step backwards. There's no way to have done a negotiation with 195 countries 
uh, where you were going to actually negotiate each other's targets and timetables. That's, that is what we did in Kyoto. This was, and I was in Kyoto, and Kyoto was basically a negotiation between the U.S., Japan, and the EU, and we were negotiating each other's targets. You can't do that. Once, once you agreed, which we did in Durban in 2011, that we were going to have this mandate for this new negotiation, it's going to cover everybody, everybody's going to have to act, then you couldn't, you could no longer have that sort of negotiation. So the notion of, an, of a bottom-up nationally determined structure uh, made enormous sense. But then, you know, to go to your question, Bruce, there was the, the natural concern about how we don't just want people to, to give us low balls. We need, to, we need to actually get the best that we can out of people. And the thing that we suggested was that um, let's make sure that people have to put in, countries have to put in their, their proposed targets early. Uh, we, we proposed, uh, I mean, it was negotiated in the, the COP uh, in 2014. Uh, we proposed by the first quarter of, uh, of 2015. Couldn't quite get that done, but we, but we got something done, which, which still involved early, um, early submissions. So what you then had was both, so, and, and the reason that matters is because if, if they come in early, they're subject to the sunlight. They're subject to the, to the scrutiny of other countries, the press, institutions like this one, think tanks, analytic bodies. Everybody's looking. Everybody's looking and saying that looks good, that looks bad, that looks wherever, and countries respond to reputational pressure. So you then had the secondary very positive effect of this drumbeat of, of submissions coming in all year. You had you know, 7, then you had 10, then you had 15, 25, 47, and on and on it went until you got to 186. Now, okay, back to your <laughs> – that, that was a little detour. Back to your specific question. Um, the difference, so there's, a, there's, a, there's an outfit called the Climate Action Tracker. They, they're one of the best analytic groups that, that assess where we stand with respect to emissions and where we're going. And they, so they do a yearly assessment, and, and as of uh, October of 2014, they said that based on the current policies that had been put in place by countries, you know, having to do with the targets that they had taken for those who had to 2020, that involved some, but, but not uh, not that many. Uh, we were on a track to, to a 3.6 degree increase Fahrenheit, uh, obviously way, way uh, out beyond the two degree goal. Uh, the report from 2015, for October 2015, is that we're at 2.7. 2.7 is a long way from 2, but it's also a long way from 3.6. So in the first set of these INDCs, which are going to keep ratcheting up, again, we, we, we hope every five years, uh, that there's already been this big, big move. So that's, I guess, that's the first thing I would say that, that a big move has already been made. And then, and then you you need to look at uh, again at the structure that that you have these five-year review periods and the and the and the ratcheting up cycle of what countries uh, are supposed to do, built into the agreement. And then you also have to recognize that fundamentally, what needs to happen in the world is that countries. Put in place the rules of the road, of the road, the incentives, and remove, putting in place incentives, and removing barriers, so that so that the right kinds of, uh, of policies are in place, and the right kind of action can uh, to, can take place in countries that build toward the transformation of the energy system. So that's that's what this is all about. We're all every, everything we're talking about is about transforming the the uh, energy base of the global economy from high to low carbon. That's what that's what's going to get us down to two degrees and below two degrees. There's a big big piece that's important on land use also, but the kind of heart of the matter is that transformation of the uh, of the energy system, and the, what what an agreement like this is meant to do is to create a framework, a structure that's lasting, that's that's got this continual ratchet up that, that subjects countries uh, to uh, be under the spotlight through transparency, so that so that. Uh, those the right kinds of signals are sent again both to countries and to, and to business and researchers and, uh, and investors to get us on that path. So that's I think that's about it. You can't really do more, you know, in one in one fell swoop. Um, you use the phrase transforming energy systems and transforming energy sector. Uh, we look at you know, climate change is always treated as the ultimate global issue, and you talked about the pressure for an inclusive global negotiation. But it only takes the top 10 economies in the world to get 75% of global uh, greenhouse gas emissions, right? So just talk a little bit about the, 
was it a tension? Is it a complementarity between the kind of work you were doing with the biggest economies in the yeah. world and small groups yeah. and this more inclusive uh, UN negotiation? Right. So, um, so they are complementary. You can't have one without the other. Um, I so I, I guess I kind of cut my teeth on this issue uh, in the when I was in the Clinton White House, and uh, as, as you said, Bruce, I, I was got sort of drafted into uh, jumping onto the, the team that was preparing for Kyoto uh, about four or five months before Kyoto. Um, now I've lost the. Give me the question again. Tension between small groups, yeah, right, separate so, powers, right, right, and right, inclusive. So, so I, so I, I saw close up the uh, what goes on in an actual COP meeting, which is uh, a little bit chaotic, <laughs> best, uh, a little bit like a circus, and not a place where you have serious, kind of thoughtful, reflective discussions with. Key players, you, you you know, you're running around doing many things, and there's and there is, I mean, we, we have actually moved from the level of acrimony that has historically been there, but there was still a great deal of that when I started, and there has been quite a bit of that all the way up until now. So we decided coming in in uh, in 2009 with uh, President Obama that we wanted to have a smaller body of countries, uh, basically a major uh, economies group of countries. I had interestingly, uh, at least it's interesting to me anyway, <laughs> um, written an article in my, uh, you know, in the interregnum between, uh, between the Clinton and Obama administrations um, calling for the creation of, of such a, a body for major environmental crises. Uh, it wasn't focused only on climate change in the article, but that's obviously what we did in, in in real life, and uh, so President Bush had created such a body. It was called a Major Economies Meeting. Uh, it wasn't devoted to getting you know, a new international climate agreement because that wasn't so much the orientation of the Bush administration. But it, but it, but nonetheless, he had pulled this group together. It's essentially, the G20 minus uh, Saudi Arabia, Turkey, and Argentina, with 17 countries. And so we kept that group of countries. We christened it with the with a slightly different name and gave it a different mission, which was really to use it as a facilitating uh, discussion forum for the negotiations. We also hoped, this never really came off as much as we wanted to, we also hoped that this group that was responsible for probably 75% of global emissions would, would take action, uh, you know, concrete action um, in, in their own right in, in various uh, technology uh, ways and uh, and that again that didn't happen so much for for a variety of reasons which get us off the point but um, but we we in, back in 2009 we actually had six meetings of the uh, of the major economies forum the MEF uh, it, the first number were were uh, centered around the um, preparation of a leader statement which was uh, produced for the uh, I think it was the G8 meeting that because I think it was a G8 plus meeting that was at L'Aquila in Italy in, in July yeah, right. of 2009. Uh, and there were the, the, those who weren't part of that meeting were invited, so we had a, a MEF segment of that of that leaders meeting. Um, but each year we kept that we kept that going usually three or four times a year and it became the place where we could discuss the key issues, whatever they were at that particular time. Uh, uh, to be resolved that year, and it's a place where we can socialize ideas, try to get uh, get countries used to thinking about X or Y or Z in a particular way. It wasn't a negotiation forum, and, and it wouldn't have had any credibility uh, as such, but I think it, it was important. It was high level, it's ministerial group, and you come together that often, and you get to know each other, and there's a certain intimacy. Um, did we, we, we learned, actually, that the that literally the size of the table, the size of the room mattered. I mean, there was one meeting, I remember, that the EU hosted. Uh, so we would do these in the U.S., but also in other countries. The EU hosted in Brussels, and you probably could have sat 75 people around the table. It was this gigantic table, and you had to speak in microphones because nobody could hear otherwise. And it kind of wrecked the meeting because you just didn't have the back and forth that we that, that sort of became the mark of, uh, of the MEF. We also did uh, did enormous 
um, amount of bilateral work um, with China in particular, not only China, but China more than anyone else. Uh, and you know, as you said in your intro, Bruce, the, the, uh, the ultimate uh, joint announcement in November of 2014, I think was hugely important. It didn't come out of nowhere. Um, so, you know, I had been working, my, my counterpart and I both go all the way back to 2009, he even a little bit before me. So we've had many, many, many dozens of meetings together over the course of the years. You know, I went to his hometown, I took him to Chicago, took him to a Cubs game, had him to our house for dinner, you know, took him to see my old friend from the Clinton days, Rahm Emanuel, who's the mayor. Um, just a lot, a lot of work all, all through the years. And Secretary Kerry came in. <laughs> In 2013, he was very committed to, to cranking this relationship up even more, and he wanted to do a, an initial statement between the U.S. and China uh, and to create a, a working group, a climate change working group between the two countries. And uh, he went in April uh, and got those things established. There is now uh, this climate change working group is kind of the preeminent collaborative body between the U.S. and China on climate issues. Uh, we've worked on a whole uh, number of, sp of specific uh, te technology areas, but also on the negotiations. Um, later, in, later in 2013, in the summer, there was the Sunny Lands Agreement on, on uh, HFCs, a short-lived climate pollutant that, uh, that uh, President Clinton did with President Xi. And then we sort of came around into January of 2015. 2014, sorry, and, uh, and again, Secretary Kerry said, okay, we, we had a good year, now we got to crank it up, what are we going to do next? And, uh, and out of that, out of that, you know, push from Secretary Kerry, we came up with the idea uh, to do, to try to do a joint announcement with the Chinese of what our targets would be, and I went with, with Secretary Kerry to China in February or March of 2014, and uh, and we started to talk about that idea. I mean, I, I met with my counterpart, and, and he was open to it. And Secretary Kerry, uh, you know, met with the president and, and premier and, and the foreign minister, all the all the top press in China. And we started talking about this notion of working together, working collaboratively on our targets, sharing information, with the aim of of, of jointly announcing uh, if we could if we could get there. Uh, and it was a nine-month effort, and uh, and produced that that agreement. That then, I think, I think that was just a kind of you know, major elect. It sort of electrified the the climate world. I mean, that was the you, you, the the image of these two historic antagonists, kind of the the big gorillas in charge of their own, you know. Uh, feuding camps in, in, in you know in the, in the history of climate negotiations was striking in itself, and the fact that these that, that we had each put forward our, our targets, I think, also um, was a tremendously influential event with regard to other countries starting to produce their own targets. Right? So, these, even though these weren't literally the INDCs that we submitted, they were essentially they essentially were the same thing. We announced what we were going to do. And then other countries started to follow suit. Uh, and I think other countries looked at that announcement and said to themselves, and I, you know, I've heard any number develop, developing, you know, all over the place, say to me when they saw that, they thought this deal is going to happen. Um, so, long way around. Um, I was struck comparing the language, and if you read the, the U.S.-China agreement, it's extraordinary, clear, urgent language about, about the issue, and then I contrasted it with the, the Paris Agreement, uh, paragraph 100, which is the kind of core of the text, the stock taking on INDCs, reads as follows, request the ad hoc working group in the Paris Agreement to identify the sources of input for the global stock take, refer to an Article 14, 
and to report to the Conference of Parties with a view to the Conference of Parties making a recommendation to the Conference of Parties serving as a meeting of the parties, and it kind of goes on. And it must be hard at times to maintain the kind of sense of urgency and focus of the scale of what we're doing and yet navigate through this uh, well, very UNE's kind yeah. of text. So, yeah, there is some of that. There's no, there's no doubt. There, there are, um, just sort of for, for kind of information's sake, there are two different related pieces of this that get negotiated. One is the agreement. That's the legal instrument. Um, that's the instrument with legally binding provisions. The targets are not legally binding, but all sorts of provisions on accountability and transparency are. I wouldn't say that's, you know, that's not exactly Fitzgerald, but it's better than <laughs> – it's, it's, be, it's better than – I didn't than, pick out a particularly it's bad it's better, it's better than the decision. So the agreement is, is shorter – Cleaner in its in its like, pros again. I, I wouldn't recommend it for anybody uh, looking for a good read at night. But um, <laughs> but uh, but the decision then, which tends to be the the the, the document that is intended to implement yeah. various of these provisions uh, and to point a more technical way forward, it does read like that. Um, the other thing that that I would uh, that I would just um, Say though, because I, I, I realized that uh, that I there was a part of your last question that I didn't really touch on, which is that so you have this action with the, this, the, these discussions that we have all during the year and all during the years with the major economies forum, and the and the uh, the big discussions that we have with China. There were also important discussions with India. The president met with uh, Prime Minister Modi twice in a very short space of time the, uh, in in September of. Uh, 2014, again in January of 2015, uh, President Rousseff came from Brazil in the summer and we negotiated uh, actually a quite important um, climate change document with the Brazilians. So that, that, that's all work being done with the big guys. And of course, we're working with the EU and, and other developed countries all the time. But, there, but it's also, you can't get it done just on the back of the big boys. Uh, and so the, the, there, there are a large number of developing countries who obviously are, are not in the category of the bigs, and they matter because this is a this is a body with 195 players, and it's a consensus rule. So, uh, if any small number decide, really, literally, if, if any one says no, you don't have consensus. I have certainly I've been there. I've seen I've seen the process where. You know, some country is jumping up and down, practically standing on the table, and there's only one, and the chair says, seen, no objection, and, you know, gavels are through. But you can't do that if you've got any, you know, if you've got three or four even, you already can't do that. Um, so the, the, the smaller guys matter. And they also matter because uh, they, they if, you, if you can work with the right grouping, it, 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 you, well, let, let, me, let me just sort of, back up and, 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 and explain exactly what I mean. So we cared about, and, and, the, and the EU cared about, high ambition in this agreement. We did not what we didn't want just an agreement to go through that was kind of so-so. We wanted strong transparency, we wanted strong uh, uh, targets and, and, and provisions that for five-year updates and so forth. Uh, and there were certainly those uh, among the, in the developing country uh, group who were not interested in that, would have been happy with much less, and particularly weren't interested in anything that chipped away at the firewall um, that I talked about earlier. But there's also a group of developing countries that are progressives, and, uh, and that group tends to include uh, a group of progressive Latins, the island nations who are more existentially threatened than anybody else, and a lot of uh, least developing countries who are also quite worried about the, the impacts of climate change. EU, back in 2011, pulled that group together in a coalition that helped create the mandate for this negotiation. And that was the first time I'd really seen that group pulled together with the EU. We were kind of on the margins of it. Back in 2011, we were kind of focusing most of our attention with regard to getting this mandate done on the so-called basic group. That's China, India, Brazil, and South Africa. Um, if you look at the meeting that occurred, so fast forward to this year, there was and there were, there were four meetings at the uh, level below ministers. So in the, for this purpose, I'm the U.S. minister. Uh, 
but the, sort of below that level, um, four meetings of all 195 countries during the course of the year. And the last one of those was in late October. And it was very negative, very acrimonious meeting. There had been a new text put forward that, that, uh, that produced a lot of anger uh, among developing countries. And the G77, under some quite strong leadership, really kind of you know, rounded, the, rounded everybody on the developing country side up uh, in quite a lot of opposition to, uh, to where, certainly where we wanted to go. And the, and the progressives' voices were all really still. They were kind of cowed. So the, you know, I, coming out of that meeting, was uh, very keen on trying to uh, work with the EU and others uh, to um, kind of revive that, that coalition of progressives. Uh, and I think that that, uh, again, the EU has kind of had the leadership on this all the way through, but, but we very much got engaged with it as well. And, uh, and uh, the Marshall Islands under the leadership of, uh, of their foreign minister, Tony De Bruyne, played a crucial role. And this coalition kind of blossomed in Paris uh, and uh, came to be called the High Ambition Coalition. It grew and grew. More and more countries wanted to associate themselves with it uh, as we went forward. I'm sure it was well over 100 countries. Uh, and it created a, a real force, a real sense of, uh, of pressure in the right direction for the, kinds of, for the kind of agreement that we all wanted. So that's, that's a combination of working with the big guys, but also, uh, but also building a coalition between big guys and smaller countries that I think became very, very potent. Let's turn to the audience. I suspect there'll be a lot of questions, and, uh, and we'll have time for a couple of rounds, I think. So let's start at the front, and we'll work our way to the back. Gentleman on the left here. There's a microphone coming. Hello, my name is Pablo Rodas Martini. In the early 19th and 20th century, Woodrow Wilson tried to get the ratification of the League of Nations in the U.S., and he failed. Uh, the, the other party, the Republican Party, didn't ratify the League of Nations. And then a few years later, you have the Second World War. Now, uh, what is going to happen if we have a Republican president like Trump, Cruz, or Carson? Or even if that doesn't happen, what happens if they continue controlling the two houses and they block the entire agreement? Or even if they just filibuster some key issues of the agreement in order to make it fail? But what would happen in that case? Uh, I'm going to take two or three questions. Okay. okay. I'm going to go back to you. So let's keep going. We'll stay in the front for a moment, right up here. Um, I'm Sheridan Highland from the Blue Moon Fund, and I wanted to ask a little bit more about, you know, the, the next, the short-term and longer-term steps for China and the U.S. to keep the momentum going on their climate change work. Um, you know, what do both countries need to be focusing on to keep everything moving forward, especially with the 2016 pres U.S. presidential election coming up? Okay, let's take one more from the middle of this uh, group here. Yep, and then we'll and then turn to you. Talk. Yes. Yes. Hello, Rich Blousing, uh, journalist. I have a question that ties in with the gentleman's first question, and that's the uh, import, uh, the difference between the words "shall" and "should," and how that ties in with an executive agreement or a treaty. And in particular, that would be um, Article Four, Four on taking economy-wide measures. Should they or shall they? <laughs> Tackle some of those. It will come as no surprise to you that I'm very familiar with, with which article that is. <laughs> <laughs> um, so let me let me start with the first one first. Uh, so look, I I think that that we have first of all just to you know to take a step back. This is not an agreement that requires Senate ratification in the way or Senate advice and consent to use the right term. Uh, in the way that it's structured. There, there are different avenues by which presidents uh, uh, bring the United States into joining international agreements. It's very, very common that, uh, that, that agreements are done uh, in different ways. Sometimes they're done as, as treaties that need to go to the Senate for, for uh, advice and consent. But it depends on what, the, what is actually in the, uh, in the text uh, and also Certain related, fa related factors. This this one does not require uh, submission to the Senate for advice and consent. So in that sense, it's not the case that Congress can block the president from from joining if the president chooses to do so. Which I assume that he will. Um, uh, 
You then have a, have a, a question about, well, what happens if, if there's a, a Republican administration next? I, I think that it, there, there is a history, there's a, quite a long history in this country of, uh, of international agreements being done, whether they're done with, with uh, Senate approval or they're done in, in uh, those executive <coughs> agreements. Where one administration follows another, it can be Democrats following Republicans or Republicans following Democrats, where uh, respect is accorded to the, uh, to the undertakings that the United States has taken, because the United States takes these, uh, un, you know, enters into these agreements, not as the Republican administration or the Democratic administration of the United States, they enter into them as the United States of America. And uh, it would be, uh, it would be a, a very consequential thing uh, and a very unwise thing if, uh, if the historic practice observed by both parties were to suddenly be uh, turned on its head and, uh, and, and, you know, and, and an agreement like this uh, discarded. Uh, and I, I really don't see that happening. And I also don't see that happening because this is an agreement with enormous, enormous international uh, approval uh, and, and a great deal of momentum. And for anybody to come in now and say uh, that, well, we're going to walk away from this, is going to do would do so much foreign policy and national security damage to the United States that I just I don't I truly don't uh, imagine any president who, who might be coming uh, coming at the end of you know as, as a result of next year's election doing that I would also say that this agreement is negotiated in a way that uh, that um, that should should have I mean if people. Want to look at the at the uh, at the substance, uh, and not um, you know not sort of just in, engage in, uh, in 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 from the hip uh, attacks. This is a this is a truly an agreement that should have wide bipartisan support. I mean, it it, it I mean, if, if you look at criticisms that have come in the past, developed countries are acting not developing. Why should we act if China is not? How can we have legally binding this and they not? I mean, all all manner of Objections that have been historic objections that we've heard uh, in the past have really been addressed here. So this is the kind of agreement that both sides of the aisle should support. So I really, for a whole set of reasons, I would be stunned, and, and I, I don't expect to see a situation in which the United States would, would walk away from this. About the question on what the U.S. and China need to do to kind of keep the momentum. Right. That, was, that was just question number one. Okay, good. good. <laughs> um, uh, well, I, you know, I think that that uh, that really coming out of the um, November 2014 joint announcement, the U.S. and China, and you know, and the, the lead up that I already recounted to that, and what has come in, in the follow up. Because remember, we had a very important joint statement between President Obama and President Xi in September of this year in the White House, and now we have this new agreement. So the U.S. and China are very wrapped up with each other right now uh, with, uh, with, with respect to climate change. The, you know, the President, and President, President Obama and President Xi had a bilateral meeting in, uh, in Paris on that first day when the President, uh, when the president went, uh, and the Chinese talk about climate change as a bright spot uh, in the U.S.-China relationship, and as an illustration in what is kind of their this, this sort of slogan, if that's the right word, uh, of, the, of, the, of President Xi's own administration vis-a-vis -vis, uh, the, uh, the U.S., which is to, to build a new model of great power relations. And they talked explicitly, and he talked explicitly in the meeting with President Obama, of climate change being an illustration of a, new pot, of a new model of great power relations. So that our two countries are very invested in each other in, uh, in making the international, the multilateral agreement work and in making our bilateral cooperation work. And again, there is now uh, a, uh, you know, it's, it's at this point, I guess, two and a, almost two and a half years old, the Climate Change Working Group. There's a whole, you know, kind of uh, set of, uh, of, uh, of initiatives that are operating under the banner of that uh, of that working group that uh, involve a whole host of, uh, of areas, uh, vehicle efficiency and 
and research in carbon capture and storage and uh, research in, in, in uh, smart grids and, and a whole number of, uh, of areas. And so I, I have every ex and, 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 and I should say that there is a vehicle, there is an every year vehicle, the strategic and economic dialogue, which in the way that the, that the working, that the climate change working group came up, that's the delivery point each year to, to make new announcements, to both put forward a report saying here's where we are with respect to the five, that, that the original five, and then the two more, and then we're going to do two more. So there's a whole sort of tissue of relations um, with us and the Chinese that I think is just going to grow and continue. Uh, and, um, and I think both sides are very invested in making that happen. And there are enough, you know, there are enough interactions built in throughout the year that, that I think that that will happen. Um, on shall and should, I don't know if everybody probably hasn't heard the uh, heard about this little kerfuffle at the end, <laughs> but um, but uh, the, the so the legal form of this agreement is very important from for us from the beginning. Uh, we uh, favored a proposal that New Zealand, uh, as it turned out, quite usefully put forward uh, on their own, which is which was essentially a kind of hybrid legal agreement with targets that were not legally binding and much of the other both kind of process and, uh, and transparency and accountability elements legally binding. Um, but the, the, the use of particular verbs in an international agreement often is what makes a provision legally binding or not. So if you say that a country should do X, that is not legally binding as it's understood. If you say that a country shall do X, that is legally binding. So we could not have shall in connection with our targets because that, that's, that's not, the, not the kind of agreement that we were, that we were seeking for a whole variety of reasons. And, uh, and all of this was, had been thoroughly negotiated with respect to the relevant paragraphs of the mitigation section with the French, with the Chinese, with everybody. Uh, if you look at the previous drafts of this agreement, they all said, they all said in the, with respect to that pivotal uh, paragraph, they all said should. Um, we had, we had, uh, we had uh, negotiated some kind of alterations in the, par in, in, in the relevant paragraph, but always still with should, and, and we were completely joined at the hip with the Chinese and many other countries on this. We had sat down, I had sat down personally with, with President, uh, with uh, Foreign Minister Fabio as the president of the COP, and, and discussed this specific paragraph. Uh, and somehow or other, when the final, uh, the final draft was, uh, you know, was beeped around to everybody's computers and we printed them out on, uh, in uh, sort of in, in the early afternoon on Saturday, and, you know, my team and I all sat down at the table and started reading through it. Uh, I'm actually the one who saw, you know, got to, to Article 4, Paragraph 4, and it said shall, and I said, what happened here? <laughs> and, uh, and we called, you know, Secretary Kerry was there, and we, we called uh, uh, Mr. Fabius, and he had no idea that it had happened, and we were, you know, we had very, you know, close working relationships, as did many, with the actual drafting team for the French, and they didn't realized that that had happened. So somewhere, some gremlin got into the system and, uh, and uh, Shell appeared where it shouldn't have. And, but then you, then you have to go into the final plenary and get it fixed. And that's not so easy because people will immediately suspect that, that you know, the U.S. has some trick up its sleeve and it was completely not true. So there was a lot of, this took 90 minutes. Delayed the, delayed the start of things for 90 minutes because we had to walk around, as did the French, the others, the Chinese were actually very supportive um, to explain that, no, 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 that was never supposed to be that way. And, and in the nature of international negotiations, which are, you know, do not proceed by the Marquis de Greensbury rules often, um, <laughs> countries who see this ha having happened, even if they believed that it was unintentional, still start to calculate what can we get for agreeing to let it be fixed. So it took a little while, but it was it was more a kerfuffle than a than a life threatening event. <laughs>
I cut my teeth on uh, UN negotiations with Arab Israeli issues, and to this day, 60 years later, they are still hamstrung over the difference between the French language and the English language version of, of Resolution 242, one of which says land and the other says the land, and to this day, it's, right. uh, so the words do matter. Let's do one quick final round. Uh, we'll come on to this side, so gentlemen in the middle, and we'll, we'll take a couple more and then give you the final word. Hi, uh, Lee Logan with Inside EPA. Um, so, so the new spending deal that was just announced this week um, doesn't include a prohibition on the U.S. contributing to the Green Climate Fund. And so I'm wondering if, you know, the U.S. is finally able to make its first installment into that. How does that help with uh, some of the, with implementing some of the details of the Paris Agreement, such as the accountability provisions? Yeah. So um, I'm actually not going to make any comment about the budget deal. Um, I appreciate the question, but I'm not going to give you a direct answer to that. But I will say in general that, uh, that our uh, providing funding uh, and all countries providing funding uh, is hugely important. I mean, it's, it's a big part of the – it was an important part of the negotiations. Uh, and um, and uh, it will be important going forward. It will be important that countries uh, – that, that uh, countries who are either developed countries or there are a number of developing countries now who have also uh, – are making themselves donors. Uh, there, there are nine developing countries that contributed to the Green Climate Fund. China, during the – President Xi's visit here uh, announced a three billion dollar uh, fund of, of their own, China's own, uh, to provide uh, climate assistance to, to developing countries. So it's very important, and we will go forward and, uh, and do our best to uh, to provide funding. But I'm not going to get into the specifics of that question. Take one more at the back. Uh, Tom Simchak with the British Embassy. Um, so what are the next steps? I mean, when, when the U.S. diplomatic team returns in January, having hopefully caught up on some sleep, um, what's on the to-do list for the next uh, six or eight months? Yeah, um, thank you. And, um, and we work really, really – there's a great team uh, for the U.K., and, uh, and we work very, very closely with them, and, uh, and I, I appreciate it. Uh, our collaboration with the UK uh, all the way through, uh, all the way through this year. Uh, there, so you have the agreement, then you have this decision that Bruce was reading that kind of gibberish out of, um, and uh, and there are actually a number of areas where where guidance or guidelines uh, need to be developed and written. I mean. The, Maybe the best example is uh, on the transparency regime. Uh, we got really what we wanted in the uh, in the two pages or so on transparency in the agreement. We had been pushing against a number of countries who were looking for about four lines in the whole thing. Just you know, we're, we'll agree to we'll agree to set up a, a a robust transparency regime, details to follow. We didn't want that. We needed we wanted enough details so that when guidelines negotiations began, there'd be real guideposts along the way that, that, uh, that laid out enough clarity about what kind of uh, system that we were talking about. And, and we got that, but nonetheless, you, you don't have all the, all, you don't have all the detail that you need to set, to set that up. So, um, so I think that'll be uh, an area. There will be uh, various areas uh, with respect to, uh, to mitigation that have to do with uh, guidelines for the kind of clarifying information that should be provided for uh, nationally determined contributions going forward. So, uh, um, you know, you, you, if you, let, let's say it's a, a country is putting forward uh, a, a, a carbon intensity target that China has three different, actually four different sub-targets. One of them is that. Uh, it matters a whole lot. I mean, it matters not just a whole lot. It matters completely. How you calculate what your what you know what your GDP calculation is uh, if you if you're uh, putting forward a reduction against business as usual and this is all this isn't what developed countries do but it's still what some developing countries do it matters hugely how you're calculating what your business as usual curve is because if you imagine that that a country kind of jacks that up higher than it really is then it's very easy to get a quote reduction because you're actually not making much of a reduction at all so. 
there are lots of, uh, of, uh, of uh, uh, there's information that will need to be included as part of, uh, of INDCs going forward. Um, there's, there's, in any event, uh, there, there are probably at least a half a dozen places where there's guidance and guidelines that will, that will need to be uh, worked out, a uh, working group that's getting set up here in, in adaptation and, uh, and uh, this and uh, things that are being done uh, really in all of the different, uh, different uh, elements of the, uh, of the text. So that the, the aim next year will be to do decisions uh, that carry that work forward to finish that work where it can be, uh, and to get it, you know, get it uh, moving at a at a good clip in areas where it'll take more than one year. Um, we're going to have to wrap, but I wanted to do two things. Uh, first, I wanted to acknowledge Charlie Ebinger, who's led our uh, energy work here at Brookings for a long time, and to thank uh, both my staff, in particular City, Jonas, and yours, who I suspect got even less sleep in Paris than you. Uh, I'm looking at you too. Um, uh, and then to uh, send a particular thanks to you from Strobe Talbot, who, uh, President of Brookings, who uh, to his chagrin is in India rather than here. It's not chagrin that he's in India, but it's chagrin <laughs> that he's not here. Yeah. Um, those of you who follow these things know that India is in a particularly difficult position on climate things, and that translates into being, I think we could diplomatically say, a pain in the ass in, in global climate negotiations. Um, you said and, that, uh, <laughs> not me. Uh, and what Strobe said to me is that uh, spending time in Delhi in the immediate aftermath of Paris, he's heard, quote, nothing but praise and respect for Todd and something close to awe of his mastery of the science. Uh, and one of the senior Indian negotiators said to him, and this I think is characteristic, and we've seen it on stage, that Todd is, quote, a patient but persistent gentleman diplomat. Uh, I think that's high praise. And uh, Todd, thank you very much for being Thanks here. Thanks very much. Thanks, everybody.